Okay, everybody, I hope this is coming through okay. This is uh, week 11, it's the week after spring break, and what I, what I thought I wanted to do here first was um, uh, just give an overview of the rest of the semester. So everything right now is um, invisible, but I figure we're this close to the end, and I know this time of year a lot of people want to maybe um, kind of work ahead a little bit just so that you're not caught off guard at the end. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and open everything up. Brian Kearns had this course set up sort of in uh, reverse order, which is, which is kind of fun. So um, anyway, we're, we're right now in week 11, which is chemicals. Uh, next week, 12 is fibers. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and um, I'm going to go ahead and kick this forum off. Um, week 12 discussion, just so I'm not caught off guard on that. Add new discussion topic. And I, I might have mentioned this before, but I, I did get a neat email not too long ago from a um, senator, or not, not maybe not a senator, but a um, political leader saying that he would like to see the hemp industry revived in Montana, because apparently it's taking off pretty well in Canada, and he was looking for support on that. Um, if, I can, if I can find that message, I'll plop it in there. But for now, um, let's, just, let's just say a hemp industry. Um, you know, and, and what, what we might do here, too, is we, you know, we can say hemp industry versus... Um, now, let's, I'm going to put three threads up. Here, here we go. So hemp industry... Um, please uh, take a look at what the uh, tensile strength is of uh, hemp uh, versus other natural fibers. And just you know, for a review, tensile strength is how much uh, how much stress a fiber can sustain in, in tension. So here's a, here's a quick little shot of what that looks like. This is, this is pretty straightforward stuff for me being a structural um, engineer. So a, a fiber, let's see here. Get this thing, I've got my pad. Let's draw this direction. So a fiber is going to have some, um, some length and it's going to have some area. So here's the length from top to bottom. Here's the uh, area, just the cross-sectional area. And if you pull on this with some force, it's going to displace some distance x. So what you end up with as uh, the farther you pull it in the x direction, so we're going to take this fiber and pull it, the more uh, force the thing feels until finally uh, it breaks, right? So that's the fracture point. You can convert that into two engineering um, values, one of which is called strain and the other one of which is called stress. And so what you'll get is, is the same thing. And the engineering values allow you to compare materials. So um, this is just going to be the um, um, ultimate tensile strain, and this is going to be the ultimate tensile stress. So the, this little epsilon means strain the way it is defined. Strain just equals the displacement, so how far you've pulled it over the length. So it has no dimensions. So you know, if something was 10 centimeters long and you stretched it one centimeter, the strain would be uh, 0.1. And then you can do the same thing with stress, and that's a lowercase Greek sigma equals the force over the area. So, um, so this, this stress will sometimes be called the ultimate tensile strength. And so what I'd like you to do, and we can even do a little bit of digging right now, um, ultimate tensile strength. You know, and the, the Wikipedia is pretty good for this. And you, there you can see a specimen being pulled apart 
they might even have, yeah, here you go. So the lines that I drew were just linear, but typically as a material fails, it's going to sort of go through this irreversible plastic deformation, stretch, 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 and then boom, it, it can't support any more stress. So, uh, you know, take a look at that for, for hemp. And, com you know, you can compare it to steel, you can compare it to other um, uh, inorganic fibers. Um, in organic uh, fibers such as nylon, you know, for example. And then uh, maybe, you know, do a little thinking on the embodied energy. So um, take a look at that, kind of fun, you know, thing to think about in terms of fibers. We're kind of thinking about, you know, the mechanics instead of the, the chemical aspects of bioenergy. And in fact, the, the neat thing about this is that if you take the area under this curve, this whole thing ends up being uh, energy. Force, because force per unit area, if you if you take that and, and multiply the top and bottom by distance, uh, force times distance, or sorry, area times distance in the denominator, you end up with energy per unit volume, which is kind of cool. So you can see how much mechanical energy is stored in a fiber, rather than rather than uh, chemical. And just one more thing on that, just so. It, I convince you that I know what I'm talking about. We had a, just had a paper published on that not too long ago. I think it just, uh, it might have just come out last year. Yeah. Journal of Biomechanics, online version. So, well, it's not, not the best view, but we, um, Maybe, well, you can just barely see it here. Hang on, let me uh, see if I can zoom in. I don't want to beleaguer this, but we, we took um, leaves from uh, a genetically uh, sort of defined plant, uh, stretched them, and so you can see that actual curve I was showing you where you've got strain here, stress there, and then all of this uh, area under the curve is the amount of work to failure. So again, right here, um, force times distance is work, and it's the same as energy. So that's an, yet another way to think about bioenergy. It's just me mechanical energy. Okay, so there's that. And let's do this file. Save as libraries. Documents, uh, courses, RGY 242, 244, and we'll look at lecture. Um, this is 11. And this is actually, we're still, we're still in chemicals. I'll just call it lecture 11 slash 12, chem and mech, since I did a little bit of mech just there. So that's one thing I would love to look into. Um, another one, here's a good one, um, carbon uh, nanotubes. Um, how might we take uh, CO2 from the atmosphere and convert it into um, graphene and oxygen. Mm. 
Let's see if I can get the advanced editor going. Is this one this guy? No. No. Subscript. Ooh, so fancy. Um, where'd it go? Subscript. I'm surprised it doesn't know the word graphene. Let me just show you what that is really quick. checking out this guy yesterday. Um, MIT's always got some new cool thing going, but here's, here's what they had um, from a couple days ago. These, these little scrolls are individual uh, mono layers of, graph, of graphene. And graphene is basically, if you've heard the word, um, carbon nanotubes. It's, it's more or less, and we've, we've already reviewed carbon chemistry uh, in the course, but there's, um, this, is, this is more or less what um, graphite looks like. It's a, it's a planar structure. And, and kind of the, the wild thing here, if you just keep putting, um, putting carbon I'm going to do this right. One, two, three, no. And then tools. Uh, the, the, the trick is to um, eraser. The, the, the trick is to get these to go into a, a, a hexagon. So this guy's over here, this guy's over here, this guy's over here. Uh, this guy's up here. This one's over here. Uh, the, the, the neat thing about graphene, or the, sort of the, the perplexing things, you'll look at this and go, hey, what happened? Doesn't carbon have to have um, four bonds? And you look at that because you only got you know your one, two, three. The um, the issue though, it actually forms a different type of bond. I think it's called a, a sp two bond. And just to get back to the periodic table, so we know what that means. Here's carbon, and you can see that um, if we come over here to orbitals, it's got a pair of electro, well, two electrons in the 2p shell and four missing. So there's a down electron missing there, a down missing, and then a whole up and down missing there. So therefore, you need those four bonds. But uh, the the sp2 bond is a unique looking bond that is neither a sphere, that's what the S orbital looks like, or this sort of dumbbell. It's something in between the two. So what you just kind of have to, you know, trust or believe is that there's an extra, you know, electron hanging out here that's sort of floating amidst the, the all of the uh, all of these bonds. So this this sort of E, and there's there's another one here, there's another one here, there's another one here. So there are um, types of graphene that beha behave similar to uh, metals. You know, so if we go back again to the periodic table, all of, these, uh, all of these metals out here, these green guys, sort of have slightly dissociated electrons hanging out, you know, close, but not adjacent to the nucleus. And so that's what I'm trying to depict here with these sort of, um, you know, metallic bonds. And that's just called an sp2 bond because it's not really an s it's not really a p2 they just call it an sp2 so there's your graphene and what i would love to see and who knows maybe this is going to get some hits maybe not but i just disclosed this idea to the carbon x prize folks and i just had a nice conversation with um jim beck of sunburst sensors here in town 
Sunburst Sensors won the Carbon X Prize not too long ago for deploying um, sensors in the ocean. But what I would like to see is um, could we turn the sensor technology into a nano manufacturing uh, technology. So nano manufacturing is, is basically what's um, what's going on here. You know, it, it, you can call it chemistry, you can call it you know whatever you like, but these little um, sheets, they call them scrolls, are being, um, and I don't know all the details of how they're making them, but what I would love to see is just having these things being extruded into, you know, very long carbon nanotubes. So now you've got a fiber, you know, just like you know, we were talking about hemp fibers a second ago. Now you've got a, um, a fiber coming out of this thing. So the idea would be is that you had some sort of um, hole in a very thin plate. So if I can draw this um, this plate, or, you know, pla a plate of some uh, you know some thickness. Here's the, the back side. Let's see if I can draw this guy. Tools, eraser, small. So this becomes like a you know a hole sitting back here that's going through through the plate. And I would I would love to see it if maybe this thing already exists, but it's just something that occurred to me that, that might be kind of cool. And then inside the hole, you line it with um, enzymes, proteins. I, I, I know there's a there's a protein in plants that basically takes the CO2 from the air and turns it into uh, glucose, more or less. So you'd put this thing in water, and you'd have a C. Uh, you know, here comes your your CO2 at whatever. I don't and I don't know what the concentration of CO2 in the water is, but it's now close to 400 ppm in the atmosphere. It's being absorbed by the water. Sunburst sensors These guys are great um, they, They've got their uh, sort of buoys out there and they're just measuring how much CO2 is, is in the water Because the more CO2 is in the air the more is dissolved in the water leads to the acidification of oceans, etc, cetera, etc cetera. But so if you get this CO2 and I don't know all the details of their technology, but I, I believe in order to do the sensing, they have to do some sort of transport through a sensing pore. And since it's already in their technology, if you lined the, uh, the pore with a, uh, an enzyme that uh, breaks these bonds, you know, breaks, breaks those two bonds, what you would have would be graphene So I'm going to try to just draw a carbon nanotube here. You know, just, it's just pure carbon. You know, it's like a it's a Play-Doh carbon extrusion. One, two, three, four, five, six, however many. So you've got these carbon nanotubes just being extruded along with um, O2 coming out, and this kind of you know bubbles off as a gas, and then replenishes. atmospheric oxygen. The question is, and, th and this is something that would require, obviously, and here's where the rubber hits the road, is how do you power this thing? Because typically graphene bonds are only formed at very high temperature. So I don't even know if this is thermodynamically possible, but if you had uh, your enzymes sitting in here, they were able to withstand whatever temperatures and pressures were um, necessary, you would basically be extruding um, carbon nanotubes, which are now basically sequestered carbon in the form of a solid and again you'd have something that uh, looked like this just just longer it would be a continuous process and then you have um, oxygen coming back out so so there's a fiber for you <laughs> so here, here's your you know here's your fiber 
here's your sort of um, biochemistry and you could also call the whole thing you know nano manufacturing all inside of the uh, sunburst sensor uh, platform so if anybody's interested oh yeah these guys are Really, really cool um, image. Jim Jim Beck is here in town. In fact, his daughter is going to join the um, practicum this summer. Yes, yeah, so there's their, their their big win. But again, it's great having companies like that that can um, you know potentially be partners for technologies like this. So. Anyway, check that out. It'd be great to see if something actually uh, exists. Can we turn the sensor on the manufacturing technology? Uh, do a little research. There are my two submissions for, for week 12. And I'm just going to go back now quickly and open up the rest of it. Environmental impacts is week 13. We'll get to that. I'm not going to post anything just yet. I might have Mike Holacek come give a talk on that. Microeconomics. Kind of a, um, a new field. We deal with that all the time here in Missoula. Like, who's going to pay for these little little jobs, and how what, what you know? How might the um, changing climate affect the economics of Missoula? And I think we saved some money on snow shoveling this year. Because <laughs> uh, all you know, lack of snow we had, and then here's the. Um, the review forum. So let me just let me just go back now and see if there's any other forum things for me to catch up on. There's 12. There's 11. Yeah. So let's just catch up on week 11. Four replies. New. Kruger. All right. Nice. Aviation fuels seems to be uh, jet fuel. Nice. Hey, nice job though with the with the with the reference there, Nick. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so E. coli obviously is a bacteria. The full genome is known. Uh, S. cerveza, that is yeast, its genome is also known, so through genetic engineering, which, you know, obviously if we were going to do something like what I was just proposing here, there would, there would certainly be some genetic engineering going on in the um, enzymes that, that uh, break down CO2. Anyway, that's kind of cool. Uh, this albaline is an alternative aviation fuel comparable to D2 diesel. Uh, this album has some interesting qualities, uh, lower cloud point, freezing temperature at the naval. Yeah, the, the Navy is, um, the Navy's all about the, the biofuels these days. I, I think, um, I, I think we've kind of, you know, realized that with our own domestic dwindling uh, petroleum supplies, it's probably in our best interest to figure something out so we don't have to always be at the mercy of governments that are not as friendly as they might otherwise be to selling us their fuels. Uh, really pushing energy from seawater. Yeah. <coughs> yep. Yep. But yeah, and there, I think there was there was something I don't uh, we, talked about it. we we did and, and the the question for me is like how much suspended 
biomass is actually there in the in the seawater. Oh, the subs you run, they're mostly nuclear or some diesel or a little of both? Um, all the current warfare subs are nuclear. Yeah. So they do have some operating diesel. Yeah. But, um, Japan has a lot of diesel subs. Um, it benefits the whole. Yeah. So yeah. But the point here would just be that you could stay at sea longer without refueling. Yeah, with the nuclear, so I got to just keep the career, otherwise you can stay up. Mm -hmm. like, years. Is it is it um is it a is it a um is it an exposure issue? We just we all wear our, our red devices. Yeah. Um, if you went to the beach, you get more sun at the beach in like an hour. Mm -hmm. you get more yeah. Like an hour in a whole month. Mm. Yeah. Well, Soviet subs, on the other hand, weren't quite so well designed. Well designed. <laughs> I know they had more issues. Yeah. With their shielding. Mm -hmm. So far, I haven't grown any extra arms. Enough. Okay, that's good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All my kids. <laughs> no, I, yeah, I think you got the right number of eyes and fingers. That's good. Yeah. And you know what, I just want to share this too while I'm looking through the, the comments. I just got done reading a uh, book called The End of Doom. It was, it was actually pretty, um, pretty well written. This guy, he, he's done a lot of, um, lot of writing and I got to say it, it really Im improved my mood. You know, one of my motivations for getting into renewable energy was you know, pretty pretty much one of, of doom. Like, what the heck are we are we doing? You know, why you know why do we have to rely on all these uh, you know non renewable energy sources and, and fight over them? Um, this particular author, Ronald Bailey, you know, up until gosh maybe a decade ago was sort of a um, you know climate change denier, if you will. But in this book, he comes out and says, well, you know what? I've been thinking about this and doing it for a long time. It's it's real, but there are solutions. You know, it's, it's not like, we're, we're, okay, so maybe we're heading off a cliff, but at least we, we're sort of aware of that in terms of our um, greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, anyway, it was a um, really, really good book, really, really encouraging, inspire, inspiring. And he, he tied, he tied um, economics and energy and federal policy in a, in a very articulate way, and he talked about the fact that a, a nation sort of has to become wealthy enough to afford the re the R and D to actually come up with the the proper technologies, rather than the sort of business as usual dirty energy. So, I, I, I strongly recommend reading it. My my wife bought it for me because she was kind of sick of my dinner time rants. She's like, here, there's a guy that's got to figure it out. <laughs> Yeah, so check check it out, man. He's a really really uh, good author and, and and sort of has the the, the big the big picture in mind. Yeah. Yeah. Currently, the challenge is 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 price. Well. Yeah. Oh, good job, man. This is this is one of the, this is one of the best. Uh, posts I've seen. Nice, nice job there, Nick. Thank you. What else? So who's this? Um, Alexis? How do you pronounce that? Uh, Alex. Um, Ali, Ali Lix? Ali Lix is producing terpenes. Yeah. And your microbe, same, same kind of deal, huh? Okay, terpenes, better performance. Trophy manufacturing to produce aviation. Um, Sesquiterpenes is that just a formula for a for a, sort of a particular molecule? I don't know. I didn't actually look up. Let's take a look. Yeah, it, it it doesn't mean much to me until I kind of see the structure. So let me see if I can find a. Might be in 
this one. Are these, um, are the, is the image we're seeing here, are those all uh, versions of sesquiterpenes? Okay, regular monterpenes and sesquiterpenes, okay, essential oils. Terpenoids, there's one. Plant products, widespread, terp terpentine, okay, aromatic. Branch C5. Okay, that, that's right. That was the sort of the defining factor. It was the C5. Oh, there we go. Mon monoterpenes are built by two isoprene units. Uh, Squaterpenes by three. Man, it's just getting, like, too easy to, to find things now. <laughs> it's like every day. Okay, so here's monterpenes. Okay, with their single... Um, okay, so these are just different isomers of um, monterpenes. Or is, it, is it, or is it monoterpenes? Monoterpenes, there we go. I think I think carbon forms more types of molecules than anything else on the planet, and just just where it sits on the periodic table, it just binds with just about anything too. It's kind of wild. You see all these things. So. Yeah, and then what's his name? Neil deGrasse Tyson's talk. I got a chance to see him, and he he um, sort of belittles our sense of uniqueness in the universe by saying that organic matter is, um, you know, that the, there's a lot of carbon found on Earth and there's also a lot of carbon found in, in us. <laughs> same with oxygen, we're, we're not maybe as, same with hydrogen, we're not as, maybe as special as we, as we thought we were. Yeah, I've been watching a show called Star Talk. Oh yeah, yeah he's, he's a great speaker. What's uh, Evolva? Just another, another company. company. It looked like they do a lot of yeast stuff, so they're looking to maybe branch out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Linus Pauling, huh? See, I saw do something the other, the sugar, Domino's, sugar, uh, carbon. I just, I just opened a packet of Domino's sugar, like a little tiny one, and they're calling themselves uh, carbon-free sugar. 
they, I mean, Domino's been in the, in the business for... This Florida farm grows much of the sugar cane that becomes Domino sugar. There's big news. Like, well, the sugar products sugar produced right in. here are now certified carbon-free. That's because Domino's earth-friendly farming and clean energy production yeah, result in net zero carbon emissions. Since carbon is a major cause of global warming, that's news we can all feel good about. This Florida farm grows much of the sugar cane that becomes Domino sugar. There's big news. The sugar products produced right here are now certified carbon-free. That's because Domino's earth-friendly farming and clean energy production result in net zero carbon emissions. Since carbon is a major cause of global warming, that's news we can all feel good about. Visit dominosugar.com slash carbon-free and look for the Domino package marked carbon-free next time you're at the grocery store. Well, here's my guess. I don't, I don't know how they're doing it, but let me, I'll, just, I'll just throw something out there because that, you, know, you see that field of sugar out there there's no way they're like just harvesting it by hand, right? There's there's going to be some. Even humans excuse. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah. So the so the, the 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 process of harvesting is definitely going to emit CO2. What they might be doing is you know working through uh, a third party um, REC, you know renewable energy credit or carbon credit financer. Um, Adjuster, um, auditor, what have you—I don't know all the all the terminology—but to um, preserve natural carbon sinks, mm -hmm. and um, and it's kind of weird. It's not like you could predict the future, but if you if if you go back to that Worldometer site, you could sort of look at hectares of forest lost per year. It could be that Domino's has land that they're putting that they're just putting back into the biosphere. They're just, you know, growing, you know, some other, you know, non-agricultural crop that's sucking carbon out of the atmosphere faster than they're putting it in with their, with their um, uh, agricultural farm. That, that would be my guess. Because I, I don't know. Because you, anything that's moving and living or any, any technology is going to be um, Doing some type of carbon metabolism, unless you you know completely gone to to hydrogen or whatever, but um, that that would be my guess how they do it. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break. I think I've been going for more than 30 minutes here. Yeah, and then we'll get back. <coughs> 